I want to talk about a few very practical ideas for improving sports journalism. And if I were even more pretentious than I am, I'd call it a manifesto. But really, it's just some ideas to make it a bit better. And I want to start with the one great advantage that we have over other kinds of journalism, like business journalism, political journalism, or health journalism, which is that in sport, you can see what's happening in front of your own eyes. The players are performing on the pitch in front of us, and we can see who is good and who isn't, unless, of course, they're match fixing. Generally, though, in sport, what you see is what you get. We all think that Messi and Rooney are great players, and you know what? They really are great players. There's no secrets. In business journalism, as I know to my cost as a former business journalist, you get companies like Enron, companies that people think are brilliant companies, and then they turn out to be duds. Well, you don't really get that in sport. Um, there are no duds in sports. You can fool everyone for a while. Every now and then, a dud pops up, like when Liverpool bought uh, Jimmy Traore a few years ago. But within a couple of weeks, the fans, the media, and the club itself realize the guy's a dud, and he gets shipped out. So sports journalism has this fundamental accuracy that you don't find in other forms of journalism. And I realized this when I teamed up with Stefan Szymanski, uh, who's a sports economist, and we wrote a book together called Soconomics. And what had bothered me when fans or journalists talk about sport is when it began to sound, as it very often does, like drunks in the bar, where everybody's shouting out an opinion and nobody actually has any data. And that's why it was a joy to me to meet Stefan. It was fascinating, because <coughs> the guy actually had data. I mean, this is possibly too small for you to see. But what it shows in that upward sloping graph is the correlation between how much a club spends on players' salaries and how well it performs over time. And what you see in the English top two divisions from 1998 to 2007 is the correlation over that nine-year period between what a club spends on salaries over the nine years and where it finishes in the league is 89%. In Italy, Stefan did a similar exercise for 1987 through 2001. And even though the Italians were match-fixing a few games, the correlation there was even better. In Italy, the link between salaries and um, a club's performance over those 14 years averaged out was 93%. In other words, salaries of players explain almost everything in soccer. The team that pays most finishes top, the team that pays least finishes bottom is the general rule. <coughs> now, it's true that over one season that doesn't work as brilliantly as that. In one given season in England, the correlation between a club's wages and its league position is only 70%, still pretty good, 70%. And the reason that correlation is weaker in one year is because in one year, luck matters. You know, the referee making a mistake, a ball that hits the post, your best player getting injured for a few weeks. But over a period of 10 years or so, all that luck evens out, and then really wages become the sole determinant. So one thing that this graph tells us is that the players who earn the most money really are the best players. And we know that in business or in politics, it's not like that. In, in soccer, success is real. In sport, generally, success is real. Uh, as Nick Hornby said, there are no bad 100-metre runners, but there are bad journalists and bad politicians. OK, so sports journalism is more informed than other forms of journalism, and we're more honest than some forms. For example, in political journalism, often a, a journalist favours a political party or another. We don't really have that. Fans are often saying, well, um, uh, you're a secret Manchester United fan or a secret Liverpool fan, but I believe that sports journalists generally try to say which players they think are good and which they think are bad in an honest way. So now I come to what we do wrong. <coughs> and my basic argument today is that sports journalism has relied on magic, on magical thinking, and not on data of the kind that Stefan has. And I've just said that the great thing about sports is that you can judge it without spin. You don't need to hear what anybody says about the match. You saw the match. You can judge it. But nonetheless, we in the sports media are always, always asking coaches and players to give their spin on the match, which is completely unnecessary. And it's particularly strange that we listen to coaches' spin because coaches, as these data suggest, have very little impact on results. It's the players who determine results. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, the model that I think we should pursue more is, although American sports journalism is often very po-faced and humorless, it does actually use data. And so, for example, in basketball, they'll judge a player using a whole array of stats. So they'll say he's the 14th best uh, rebound or offensive rebounder in the NBA. And they'll have any number of stats on a player. In baseball, it turns out the key stat to judge a hitter, they've realized through a lot of trial and error, is on-base percentage, what percentage of times at bat he gets on base. And finally, in soccer, we're starting to get interesting numbers, both from off the pitch, about clubs' finances, and from on the pitch, about what players actually do on the field that tell us interesting things about the game. 
But instead, we ignore this data, or we look at the wrong data, and we let coaches tell the story of the game. I'm going to dwell on coaches just for a second, because to me, they're the huge blind spot in European sports reporting. Now, if players' salaries determine a team's results, then it hardly matters who the manager is. If Manchester United sack Alex Ferguson and they make me manager, or Declan, or a stuffed teddy bear, Manchester United will still be around the top of the table and might well win the league because United pay top salaries, they have the best players, and the players are determinant, generally not the coach. And people say in response to this argument, yes, but what you're really measuring is also the coach's salary because the, um, the teams with the best paid players also have the best paid coach, and so the best paid coaches are the best coaches, this is the best paid players are the best players. Now, in fact, this argument is wrong because players are paid for their contribution to results, which is very easy to see, you know, every... Every match, millions of people judge them on TV. And so you have millions of informed judges judging whether the player is good. What the manager does is harder to see his contribution to results. And he's really more judged as a spokesman. The manager is the guy who comes out and tells the story of the club before the game and after the game. And so he has to look like the face of the club. So he has to be an ex-player, generally of a certain appearance, sort of a handsome, trim man in middle age is the typical thing. It helps if he was a great player. So if you're Roy Keane and you're a great player and you look like a manager, they give you a big job right away. Uh, and that's not really to do with any judgments of whether you uh, have been a good manager, because when Keane got his first job, He'd obviously never been a manager, but got a big job, big salary. Whereas someone like Owen Coyle, who uh, became a manager with, I think, initially Burnley, um, he didn't have that pedigree, he didn't have that CV, so he gets a small salary. But that doesn't mean that Roy Keane is a better coach than Owen Coyle. It doesn't mean that Diego Maradona is a better coach than all the Argentine coaches who were not chosen to manage Argentina in the World Cup. Maradona was chosen because he looks... He is what a coach is thought to be. He, he is a famous ex-player. Now... Stefan has rec worked out that about 10% of coaches do actually make a difference. About 10% do perform consistently better with their teams than the players' wage bills suggest they should. Those guys are above the line, if you like. And you're thinking about, I mean, some obvious names, like Mourinho. He will perform better with his teams over time, not in just one season, but over time, than players' salaries would suggest. Brian Clough, Fabio Capello. When we did this measure for England, we found a couple of surprising names, like who would have thought that Tony Pulis of Stoke City was an overperformer, but he is. The other 90% of coaches, though, don't add value. They don't make a difference. But nonetheless, in sports journalism, we're obsessed with these guys. And I think it's because we in the media, we speak to the coach. He's the person from the club who comes out and talks to us. So because we see him and because he explains the result, we attribute power, we attribute agency to him, whereas he doesn't really have agency. So he comes out to the press conference after the game and he says, well, we won because of my brilliant tactics, team selection and psychology. Or he says, well, we lost because the blind referee gave a red card to our best player and it was never a foul. And then we write that in the articles and really what you read on the internet on Sunday night in the paper on Monday morning, it's called a match report, but usually it's not a match report. It's a press conference report. We report what Alex Ferguson said in the press conference rather than how United played in the game is the, is the typical way it works. So the manager spins the game and we report his spin as a, <coughs> as a favor to this guy who just doesn't matter. And then we come to players who, as I say, they do matter, they determine the results. And nonetheless, I think we spend too much time, we journalists, chasing them for quotes. And I've experienced this painfully over time and now I stop chasing players for quotes because I'm too old, it's just too humiliating and stupid. I think in the 70s, when I wasn't doing this, player interviews were probably worthwhile because players actually often said what they thought. I mean. They, they weren't sort of micromanaged corporate men they are the way they are now. So you could sit down in the club canteen in the 1970s and chat to the guy and he talked to you like he was your mate. And very few journalists were doing this, so you could get good stuff. And that's all over now. Now all the big clubs have media departments. They often want to read the interview before it's published. And players learn never to say anything controversial. So players say boring things. Uh, I live in Paris, and the other week on French TV, I saw Franck Ribéry talking and it was this amazing performance. He just rolled off cliches effortlessly without even trying. We played well, another big game coming, I hope we can win. The only thing that matters is the team performance. It was just masterful. And it was nothing. But to get that nothing from Ribéry takes many journalistic man hours of chasing him. And I'm suggesting that we in journalism spend our man hours more usefully now. Now, of course, we need players to be heroes. Sports media needs heroes because people follow sport usually not because they love tactics, but because they worship sportsmen usually as versions of the ideal men. They are the masculine ideals of today. 
people like David Beckham or Cristiano Ronaldo. And as Matthias Esterhazy just said, children don't want to be computer hackers, they want to be footballers. And so we need heroes, but I, I'm arguing that we don't need these heroes to speak. We don't need their quotes for them to be heroes. I mean, for example, let me just see if I can scroll this down accurately. Um, David Beckham, the guy's never said an interesting sentence in his life, uh, nor has Lionel Messi. Uh, I don't know if you can see some of these quotes from Beckham. My parents have always been there for me ever since I was about seven. Alex Ferguson is the best manager I've ever had at this level. Well, he's the only manager I've actually ever had at this level. Or, that was in the past, we're in the future now. <laughs> uh, I could go on forever, but um, uh, the point is, it's not really worth chasing David Beckham for quotes. It takes a hugely long time. And the same with Lionel Messi, he generally just says nothing at all. But still, they're heroes. I mean, they work for us, they sell the paper, usually with their pictures. And um, they get people watching football on TV. So I'd say, let's stop, let's stop chasing these people. Let's not spend that time and money, the little time and money that we in journalism have on that. Let's spend it on something else. And also chasing players, when you do catch them, it makes you less honest. Because to get access to a player, for him to speak to you a second time, you have to start telling lies about the player. You have to pretend he's better than he is. You can't criticize him uh, in print or in, uh, in speech on TV. And so you can end up pretending that the mediocre player who speaks to you is in fact a good player. So let's stop chasing coaches, let's stop chasing players, and let's spend what limited time and money we have on studying the wave of new data that's becoming available on sport. And I'll give some examples of data that we can use in the media, starting with sports business, because sports business is often extremely badly reported. And every newspaper needs a lady writing sports business who actually understands business, and I would suggest you should also cover match fixing. I say lady because part of our ridiculous magical belief system in sport is the notion that only men are qualified to write about sport. Example of bad sports business reporting was the bidding for the World Cups 2018-2022. Every country bidding to host a tournament tells journalists, well, if we bring this, this tournament to Russia or England, it will create a lot of jobs and new infrastructure and it will make the country richer with all the tourists coming in. People will see us on TV and that will create foreign investment. This is all rubbish. And academic economists know this. They've been writing about the subject for about 25 years. Nonetheless, in the sports pages in the last few months, I regularly saw this rubbish from host committees reported as fact. And that's because the sports business reporter A, didn't know, and B, wasn't speaking to academic economists who do know. Or take the constant reporting that a big football club's about to go out of business. Um, you get, it, it comes around every spring. Some club has high debts, and so the newspapers are saying it's about to disappear. It's going to stop existing. EPL's Portsmouth could go bust, says this headline. But you got similar reports in the last couple of years about Liverpool, even Real Madrid, because people say, well, Real Madrid have 500 million euros in debt. That's a lot of money. Can they repay that tomorrow morning? No, well, then Real Madrid might disappear. Now, any study of football history shows that only very tiny clubs sometimes disappear, and all the rest are immortal. And they're immortal because the bank or the local government always steps in to save the club. You really don't want to be the bank manager who said to Liverpool, um, you can't pay, so I'm pulling the plug and I'm selling Anfield. So that never happens. If you look at the clubs in the English League in 1911, they're almost exactly the same as the clubs in the English League in 2011, and often they're in exactly the same division. So, in other words, these clubs have survived two world wars, recessions, crazed chairmen, uh, hundreds of millions in debts, etc. They always exist. But nonetheless, a year ago, you got all these reports saying Portsmouth were gaps would go bust, and they were wrong at the time, and they were proved wrong, and it was just embarrassing and stupid, and we should stop being embarrassing and stupid. In, in American newspapers, the sports department used to be called the toy department because it was children writing about childish things, and we really don't want to live up to the toy department tag. So we in the sports media, our basic problem is that we repeat these myths without ever testing them against data. And I say we need to replace magic with data. And I've talked about the off-field data we need to consult. But now for the first time ever in, in football, and I'm talking particularly about football here, we have interesting data to judge performance on the field as well. About a decade ago, big clubs began collecting match data. And they'd count the number of passes each player made, the number of tackles, the number of kilometers he run. And for years, they took this data very seriously. And television still takes those data seriously. So if you watched the World Cup last year, you know, at half time, you'd see how many kilometers everybody had run, how many tackles they'd made. But that means that TV, we sports media, are still using data that clubs have by now discarded as being useless. Because most clubs now know you can't judge a defender by how many tackles he makes. 
And Paolo Maldini, he made one tackle every two games, I believe. So was Paolo Maldini a bad defender because he didn't tackle? I don't think so. Similarly, it's not really useful to know that somebody ran 13 kilometers if he was always running in the wrong direction, like a cartoon character. And you might have 100% completion rate on your passes, but that might be that you always were giving square balls in the center circle, also not very useful. So clubs, after years of studying this data, have stopped studying this data. And they, they realize, as people do in statistics, that you initially measure what you can measure, and then you take seriously what you can measure, even if it doesn't deserve that attention. And clubs are learning more about numbers now. Clubs are starting to abandon magic, which is another reason that we should abandon magic. And they're finally finding statistics that do reveal something. So recently I visited Manchester City, and they have this huge sort of performance department of people looking at match data. And they'd studied about 400 corner kicks in different leagues. And they found the type of corner that produces most goals is the in-swinging corners to the near post. Because everybody crowds in and the keeper might pass it away, but it's near the goal line, somebody slides it in. It's much more productive than the outswinger. But nonetheless, uh, you know, these managers steeped in football often think the outswinger works best. In fact, if you saw Manchester City play Manchester United recently, City's corners were all outswingers against their own statistical advice. Johan Cruyff, a great Dutch thinker on football, believes the outswing is the most effective corner. Well, not according to this particular statistical study. Or there's a professor at the London School of Economics um, who's done some research on the Spanish League about free kicks. And you know what typically happens at a free kick is the team's main man, the number 10 usually, gets the ball, he puts it down, waves everyone away, he walks back, runs in, and he blasts it over the bar. And that is the norm in free kicks. Of course, every now and then a ball sails into the top corner, and we all have that in our, in our minds from uh, TV replays. But typically, corner, free kicks are wasted, and they're blasted at goal, and they, they miss. And this Spanish economist, Ignacio Palacio Suerta, comparing indirect free kicks to direct free kicks, says clubs would do better on the whole if they passed the free kick. Imagine you get the ball 20 yards from goal. None of the, other play the opposition players is allowed within, I think, nine meters of the ball. So you put the ball down and you say to the opposition, maybe I'm going to shoot, maybe I'm going to pass. And you have four or five runners placed, and the other team has to mark those, making your shot more, if you choose to shoot, uh, more productive, etc. But clubs never do that. They have this tradition that they shoot free kicks at goal. And so this is another way that data is going to change soccer and that we in the media need to notice. One last stat that I found very interesting. I recently did a tour of sort of performance directors uh, talking about match data in clubs, uh, listening to them talk. And this performance director at a very big Premier League club told me he'd found the stat for value in keepers. It always was hard to know what made a good keeper, but he says you can't really judge a keeper on the percentage of shots he stops, because what if he has a great defence and the shots are all coming from 25, 30 metres? It's easy to stop those shots. But he says if you judge all keepers on how many shots they, they stop from, percentage of shots they stop from inside the penalty area, that's interesting. And then you might find keeper X, he has this amazing sh uh, stop percentage. Keeper Y, you know, he, um, his stop percentage has declined in recent years. That's interesting. So that is one of those stats that we in the media need to start paying attention to. And this club uses this stat to scout and evaluate goalkeepers. So my point is, there are more and more interesting data from on and off the field, and we journalists need to use them. We must stop believing the magic of coaches, stop chasing idiotic players for idiotic quotes. Replace magic with data, but always remain skeptical of the data. And then sports journalism is going to be more accurate, more revealing, and maybe even more fun. Thanks very much.